If you're affected by long COVID, there's a new paper out that you need to be aware of by Dr. Felicity Liu and others titled Large Scale Phenotyping of Patients with Long COVID Post Hospitalization Reveals Mechanistic Subtypes of Disease. But what does this mean in simple terms and why should you care? The thing is, this study has identified, not merely theorized or suggested, that there are people with long COVID who have patterns of inflammatory markers which can be detected on a blood sample. Okay, so far so good, but here's the kicker. The patterns seem to correlate with different subtypes of long COVID as well. Although the authors are quick to state that the study was undertaken to better understand the inflammatory processes which drive long COVID, not to discover biomarkers of disease. The thing is, that correlation of long COVID subtypes does strongly suggest that this might be the first step towards a disease-modifying therapeutic trial, potentially. Now, we know that one in 10 COVID-19 cases leads to a degree of long COVID. So it's no surprise that there's an estimated 65 million people worldwide waiting anxiously for a test which can deliver a clear insight as to what's going on with their body. And by my reading, this study isn't that yet. But I think this study is probably going to be one of the papers that we'll look back on as marking a turning point in our understanding of long COVID. So the study was led by Imperial College London and looked at 657 people who'd previously been hospitalised due to COVID-19 infections, which occurred more than three months prior to the study. Now that's important because three months is 12 weeks and that's considered to be the, the cutoff for where prolonged symptoms are now indicative of long COVID. Of those 600 plus patients, 426 still had at least one COVID symptom, whilst 233 had completely recovered. Now on the face of it, that's vastly more than the 10% of patients who develop long COVID, which jars with my earlier statement. However, the hypothesis for this difference in symptoms is that this was not a general population study, but actually was looking at patients specifically who had been hospitalised due to COVID. And that's important because we are aware that those patients seem to be at a higher risk of developing long COVID after their initial infection. The team went with a slightly shotgun style approach, so to speak, looking for a wide range of proteins. In fact, 368 separate proteins. But these are specific ones that are known to be involved in immunity and inflammation. Now, from my perspective, when I'm dealing with an individual patient, this isn't the best approach, as essentially you're throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks. The problem is you don't know if something has stuck because they should have done or if they've stuck just by chance. Given the large number of patients in this study, this greatly reduces the chances of the team having picked up so many similar findings across so many different patients by chance. So I say that so many different findings what did they actually find? Compared to the recovered patients, the long COVID patients still experiencing symptoms had detectable patterns of blood markers consistent with immune activation that was ongoing. Okay, we kind of expected that from the title, but what do they mean when they say immune system activation? The study found two signals. In fact, there was one marker of inflammation of bone marrow cells, specifically myeloid cells, whose role is to trigger other white blood cells. But there was also ev evidence of an activation of the complement system. Now these findings, specifically that complement system activation, perhaps give an idea why long COVID has been such a tough nut to crack. Because if you ask medics which lecture was their favourite at medical school, very few are going to stick up their hand and say anything to do with the complement system. And those doctors who did unsurprisingly became blood doctors and are working in haematology. Now I raise that point because when COVID came around, it was the respiratory teams, the intensive care teams, the cardiologists, the A&E and general practice teams that ended up being the heroes who bore the brunt of the workload on the ground. That was because we were dealing with patient symptoms. And it makes sense, really. If your patient can't breathe or their heart is doing something weird, you really want to be talking to the heart or the lung doctor. But now, as we're digging into what's causing that 10% of patients to remain ill, 
it appears that the haematologists and the immunologists might hold the key. Unfortunately, these guys and girls are some of the smartest doctors there are, and unfortunately we don't have enough of them, which may be why it's taken so long to get these studies out. So the complement system is by all accounts a thick textbook type medicine. And as a GP, remember I'm a bearer with a very small brain, I'm going to try and break down what the complement system does and why that's relevant to you. I suppose the first part is explaining the name. The complement system is so named as it complements or enhances the activities of two specific parts of the immune system, that of antibodies and phagocytic cells. So what happens is literally the body detects an infection, antibodies are produced and they stick onto identify markers or antigens on the pathogen. This then triggers a large cascade of reactions which complement that antibody related immune system. So whilst it's nice to know where the name comes from, how does activation of the complement system relate to the second finding from the study, that markers of inflammation from myeloid cells were also elevated? Why might that explain the subtypes of long COVID that the authors thought they could identify in the study? Oh yes, I've not gone into that yet, but the study suggested patterns of immune activation which could potentially differentiate five different phenotypes or symptomologies of long COVID. But we'll get to that in a moment. With regard to the complement system, there are five things that happen where the body notices an infection or damage to tissues. The first is what's called opsonization. So here complement proteins bind to the surface of an infectious agent, essentially tagging them for death by the body. And this death is achieved by the immune system attacking those pathogens with neutrophils and macrophages. The second bit of the complement system is a relatively straightforward one, inflammation. But what does that mean for patients? Basically, you get vascular permeability, which allows cells, immune cells, to pass into tissues. Think when you get an infected wound, when it's beginning to ooze. This is the result of inflammation triggered by the tissue injury and the infection. The third part of the complement system is what's called membrane attack complex formation, which honestly sounds like something from a 1980s cartoon, and actually might not be missing the point by that now, because essentially, it's a bomb that the immune system can produce that can be attached to the side of bacterial pathogens, which then causes the bacteria to leak and burst. So throughout this complement activation process, we also have another system going on. That's the activation of an adaptive immune response. Basically, this is about the complement system making blueprints of bacteria, viruses and damaged cells and making that blueprint available to white blood cells, specifically B cells, which leads to the B cell producing more antibodies to help mop up that infection. And then the final bit of the complement system is the cleanup teams. You see, when we've got an immune system reaction like this, we've got all these proteins and antibodies and immune stuff flying around, this part of the complement system helps clear up all those leftover weapons of the immune system, meaning we don't get tissue damage after the infection has been dealt with. And I think that is where the light bulb might go off for some people. So it's fair to say that the complement system is complex. And while lots of people haven't heard about the complement system, many are aware of diseases that occur when it goes wrong. The big names that you might be aware of are antiphospholipid syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, and as everybody knows from house, Lupus. One of the things that was particularly interesting about the findings from this study, as we've just highlighted, the complement system basically has its own cleanup crews and they're there to terminate activation and remove leftover ammunition after the infection has been dealt with. However, with long COVID, it seems we get a continued activation of the complement system and perhaps a breakdown in the cleanup crews. And first author Dr. Lif Felicity Liu strongly highlighted that it's indicative that the range of long COVID symptoms is as a result of active inflammation. And again, is that the complement system going to haywire or is it the cleanup part not working? What we can say is the information from this paper and that whole idea that long COVID is due to active inflammation does make sense with the conversations I have with patients. I mentioned earlier when I highlighted five symptomologies or phenotypes of long COVID have been identified in the study, I don't think anyone's going to be surprised to see that they were fatigue, cognitive impairment, respiratory issues, 
gastrointestinal symptoms, and also interesting enough, anxiety and depression. However, the fact that they were able to identify patterns which marked particular symptoms could be key for tailoring treatments to patients. I say that because we see this with antibiotics. You basically nuke the patient's own microbiome whilst treating that single pathogenic bacteria. And in the short term, that might cause an upset stomach, but will actually have low level lasting effects for up to three months after you've taken those antibiotics. When it comes for looking at ways to potentially modulate the patient's immune system, which is relatively important, we want to be as careful and as targeted as possible to reduce the risk of collateral damage. So these patterns indicating different symptoms or presentations along COVID might mean in the long term we can tailor specific treatments to specific patients and reduce harm from our treatments. One of the big problems with long COVID has been our lack of focus to treatments. There's evidence, plenty of evidence, of microclot issues in some patients and we do see improvements with those patients when we treat them with anticoagulation. But we haven't been able to conclusively prove what has triggered that inappropriate clotting in the first place. It may be that ongoing issues with inflammation are likely to be one of those triggers for coagulopathies. And now we have a study that might not necessarily give us the specific target, but certainly gives us a very good idea of where we need to keep looking for the answer. To which end, the authors of this paper highlighted might be able to use a series of drugs called IL-1 antagonists to treat long COVID. And I'm sure that no one's going to be surprised to hear that IL-1 agonists are used for conditions like severe advanced rheumatoid arthritis. Personally, I feel long COVID is a spectrum of symptoms related to coagulation problems, inflammatory problems, gut microbiome changes, and possibly allergic mediated responses. But you know what would tie all of these together? An autoimmune system issue, such as what this team are talking about here. But, and this is very important, the team in this paper have highlighted that they can't be sure that the findings in this paper are applicable to all long COVID patients. So we're going to take all of it, not with a grain of salt, but with some, uh, with some caution. Given the possibilities that these newly found blood markers suggest that you know, fatigue in some COVID patients might be responsible for inflammation, it also opens up the possibility of running this same panel of tests against patients who might have been affected with other post-viral fatigues, such as ME. I raise the point as doctor, uh, investigations by Dr. Liu's team have given strong evidence that long COVID is post-viral inflammation. Unfortunately, we know that such inflammation, such as when it's come from Epstein-Barr infections, you know, we've said you were fine, you had EBV, and now you've got post-viral fatigue, can be incredibly difficult to counter. But now we've got a target, it might be much easier for us to direct our medical arsenal to identify treatments that could be directed towards general post-viral inflammation. Ultimately, this to me was a really important paper and I think it gives a little bit of hope to those patients with long COVID. So I hope this has been a useful uh, little overview for you. If you'd like me to do more um, chats uh, like this when interesting papers come across my way, drop, uh, drop comments uh, down below and we'll see what we can do. With that in mind, take care. And we'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.